General Bradley. I, I think that the welcome indicates how excited we all are to have you with us this morning. This is a very proud moment for me as a fellow Missourian. Uh, we have three guests that I should like to introduce to you this morning. The first is uh, a distinguished writer, producer of uh, the American films, who happens to be the partner of General Bradley, and I'd like you to welcome Miss Kitty Bueller, Mrs. Kitty Bueller Bradley. Second, I'm sure many of you saw on television making sure that the president started in the right direction. The commanding general of the Washington Military District and our friend, General Robert Arter. The third is a fellow Missourian involved in our work and with whom we have worked closely in the past the commander of the Criminal Investigative Command of the United States Army, General Paul Timmerberg. <laughs> this distinguished lecture was called on short notice, but it has been in the works for about two and a half years. We have been trying uh, to find a time on the general's travels and other responsibilities when it would be possible for him to join us. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be possible because of all of the demanding uh, responsibilities that he has had during the inaugural exercises, from opening them to the grand marshal responsibilities. He's been intimately involved in all of them. But uh, was with him Wednesday night, and the general, Mr. Bradley, said, uh, give us a day to rest, and we want to come to the Bureau. So we're, we're just so delighted to have you both with us. One of the responsibilities of the leaders of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and you are the middle management and future leaders of this Bureau, is to demonstrate in your personal lives and attitudes and principles the quality of leadership. What better opportunity than to listen to someone who has commanded the largest fighting force in battle ever assembled under the American flag, over one million men, a soldier's general who cares about his men. I'd like to tell you a little something about General Bradley, although most of you who have studied history know him for the living history that he is. He was born in 1893 in Clark, Missouri. I seem to be mentioning Missouri a few times, you'll understand. He was a graduate of West Point in the class of 1915, the class the stars fell on, more generals than in any class in the history of West Point, and he was the first to attain the rank of general. He was a major in World War I, and in World War II, you will recall that he succeeded General Patton, command of the Second Army in Africa, involved in the invasion of Italy and Sicily, commanded the ground forces of the United States in France, landing on D-Day with his troops. In June 6th will be 37 years uh, since that memorable occasion. And I think it's interesting that the average age, Kitty Bradley, of the special agents today is 37. I think a great deal of water has gone over the, the dam in those 37 years, and many of you were not even around on June 6, 1944. And from 1945 to 1948, he was the administrator of the Veterans Administration. And then in 1948, was asked by the President of the United States to be Chief of Staff of the United States Army. And in 1949, was appointed the first chairman 
of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and served until 1953. In 1950, he was named General of the Army, the fifth general so honored in American history. The first was another Missourian, General John Pershing. In his swearing exercises on Capitol Hill, President Reagan asked us to look for the heroes of this country. We in the FBI know something about heroism and something about heroes. But I think all of us would agree that living today, there is no one in the United States who draws from us so much respect and who gives to us so much inspiration in terms of leadership and genuine heroism than the General of the Army who is here today and to whom I introduce you now. It's my pleasure and my privilege to give you the General of the Army, Omar N. Bradley. General Bradley. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, I've been in the Army now since 1911. That's a long service. They usually retire people after 30 years, but I've only been on continued duty now since 1911. Five-star generals do not retire. They keep on working for life. <laughs> I've stuck it out so far. I'm confined to a wheelchair because I have arthritis of the knees, but I'll be walking in another month, I think, and I gotta get to walking so I can fight the next war. <laughs> I'd like to walk the front line each day and see what's going on. I'll talk to you about 30 minutes, and then I'll answer questions for as long as your chief will let you. When I first joined, we had uh, no selective service. It's all volunteer. Enlisted men got $12 a month. Sergeants got 18 man that was an expert rifleman got five dollars extra pay. I think that's a good thing because we want to learn to use our weapons. You do want to carry ammunition all the way to the Rhine and then miss with it. Servicemen ought to be like uh, Mr. Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr., who played the, in the FBI picture. He never missed this pistol. <laughs> I incidentally saw him last night. I played golf with him. He's a hell of a good golfer and a good tennis player. I played on the baseball team at West Point for three years and a substitute on the football team for one year. Every member of the baseball team who stayed in the service until the war became a general. All the men who played against the Navy in football in 1914, except two who were sick, made general. So I think mass athletics is good for you. <laughs> Incidentally, in 1914, we licked both Notre Dame and Navy. <laughs> we played nine games and won them all. 
We won one of them after the final whistle blew. <laughs> they scored a touchdown on us in the first quarter, failed to kick goal. We went through the whole game. When the final whistle blew, the ball was in the air. The enemy kicked it. We caught it on our 25-yard line and ran back for a touchdown. Sent our goal kicker in. He kicked the goal. We beat him 7-6. <laughs> There's certain principles about leadership, and while I know mostly from uh, they apply to the military, I also know something about how they apply to the civilian life. I was chairman of the board of Boulevard Watch Company for 15 years, and we had a cap had the manager had the president of the company who had no leadership. And two years after I left the company, it went bankrupt. <laughs> so remember what I tell you, is not applicable only to the military, it's applicable to civil life. The first principle I'll mention is mental and physical energy. I'll cite as an example, General Sherman, I hope not too many of you are from Georgia. <laughs> he marched his army from Chattanooga to Atlanta, fought only one battle. And he fought that because Congress demanded he fight one battle. <laughs> you never get out of control of Congress. <laughs> Every night he rode over the battlefield, made a reconnaissance. He got maybe two or three hours sleep a night. He did that for the whole time between Chattanooga and Atlanta. So remember, mental and physical energy. It applies to presidents of companies, chairmen of the board, and most anybody else. You never saw any lazy man that got very far. Next characteristic I'll mention is confidence. Confidence to the point of stubbornness. And I'll cite as an example, General Grant. The battle of Shiloh started, he was 20 miles behind the line. He rode forward on horseback, met a lot of his men in retreat. He said, turn, boys, we're going back. They went back and won a great victory. He never knew when he was licked. There's a story about him in the Richmond campaign. He was up all night, reconnoitering the battlefield, drawing up his orders and issuing his orders. In daylight, he was back toward the rear of his army took his saddle off, threw it down under a tree, put his head on it, went to sleep. Half an hour later, a courier rode up, said, General, you better wake up. Your right has been defeated and is in full retreat. General Grant shook his head, shook the cobwebs out. It might have been because of drinking the night before, I don't know. <laughs> he said, it can't be so, and went back to sleep. And it wasn't so. He had confidence in his plan, confidence in his leaders, and he couldn't be disturbed. <clears throat> the next characteristic I'll mention is listening to other people. You don't know it all. Other people have ideas and have knowledge. Talk to them. I cited an example, General Lincoln. He would listen to anybody and try to correct their problems. Incidentally, I might mention here that General MacArthur was the only time since the Civil War General McClellan questioned the authority of the Commander-in-Chief. We obey the Commander-in-Chief. 
We take an oath to that effect. And nobody should, in the Army should question the authority of the President. I mention that only because all of you wonder why General MacArthur was relieved. He questioned the authority of the Commander-in-Chief. He had to be relieved. General MacArthur was one of the smartest men I ever knew, but he did question the authority of the Commander-in-Chief. He had less excuse for it than McClellan did. McClellan was president of a railroad, and at one time, President Lincoln was a law, young lawyer for working for the road, railroad. But if it's come that as it may, we mustn't, we in the Army mustn't question the authority of the Commander-in-Chief. I have another saying, see and be seen. Go around and see what your people are doing. You may not know what they're doing, but at least show an interest in their work. I was chairman of the board of Bulba Watch Company for 15 years, and I used to try to go through the plant, watch plant, in the United States. We had another one in Switzerland, and see what the men are doing. I couldn't get my president of my company to do it. He said, I don't know what they're doing. I said, well, go around and show an interest in their work anyway. And let on like you know it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rotten, who was one time president of uh, IBM, which is a big company, said the art of leadership is in running something which, about which you know nothing about. There's several other characteristics of generals and leaders, but I won't take a time to go through, through them. I think I've mentioned enough and the more important ones. What characteristics I had, I don't know. I think it was stubbornness. <laughs> I never started anything and I didn't know I could finish. When we invaded Europe, the rumor got around among my men that every one of those in the assault divisions would be killed. I went around and talked to every man in those three divisions. I went around in the field, talked from the loudspeaker from the rear end of a truck or something else. And I got through, I think they all felt better. At that time I had led the invasion of Sicily, in which I expected to be killed, but I wasn't. And uh, I had very narrow escapes six times during the world, during the Second World War, but here I am untouched. I should have been killed six times. But the more you know about, the more you know about your business, the better chance you have to live. Twice during the war, I waked up in the night and heard tanks going by. I didn't know whether they were German tanks or American tanks. I lay there a minute and thought it over, and I said, I thought I couldn't do anything anyway, so I went back to sleep. <laughs> As it turned out, both times there were American tanks. So I didn't have anything to worry about. If it had been German tanks, we'd have killed them all the next morning anyway. <laughs> I had my headquarters during the bulge, Battle of the Bulge, had my headquarters in Luxembourg. The Germans came within seven miles of that town, but I didn't move. General Eisenhower suggested I move back to safer place. Seven miles is too close to be with the, with the headquarters of that size. 
I said, no, that's where the Luxembourgers, and I didn't want to destroy their confidence in their ability to stay there. And so I stayed. <coughs> Have confidence in what you're doing. Have confidence in your plan and carry it through. Don't give up easily. Fight for it if you have to, but be stubborn about it. I think I've probably talked enough. I'll try to answer questions. If somebody would help me listen to them. I think loud enough for me to hear it, I'll make sure that the general understands the question. General, I'd like to know how, at the uh, top command level, yeah, how much knowledge was there that we had broken the German code? I think the code name for it was Ultra. Is that true? Uh, the, uh, I don't think I got all of that. Could you repeat it, please? John's question, uh, uh, General, was uh, how much knowledge uh, uh, was there among the general officers of the fact that the German code had been broken, the ultra code? Uh, well, I think we all knew it. I was about the, I was the only one that used it. One night we intercepted a message that the Germans were going to counterattack the town of Carenton in France at daylight with an armored division. All I had in Carrington was a 101st Airborne Division. They had very few anti-tank weapons. So I sent a message down to my Corps commander to send a third of an armored division over there to reinforce them. Send it over during the night. He did. He sent a third of the 3rd Armored Division to Carrington. And when the Germans counterattacked the next morning, they found a third of an armored division plus the 101st Airborne. We licked them, drove them back five miles and established our front line five miles farther to the front. Incidentally, during that fight, we killed 365 cows. <laughs> took place in the cheese country of France, and there were a lot of cattle, and they got in the way. <laughs> General, what were your major areas of agreement or disagreement with Patton over the course of the war? Patton was a fighter. I don't know what would happen to him in peacetime, but he was a fighter. He was easy to handle if he knew how. On some occasions, I'd hear him coming about a mile away, <laughs> blowing his horn. In those cases, when I knew what was coming, I'd get out a bunch of papers and put them tape my desk in front of me, study him. He'd drive up in front and get out, come in, stomp up and down a few times, and come over and hit my table with his whip. And I'd look up and say, oh, George, you here? <laughs> One time he came up on a Saturday, had some plan, I analyzed it, told him it was no good, he went away, came back the next Saturday with another plan. I listened to the whole thing, and then he got through, I analyzed it, and before I got through to analyzing it, he said, Brad, it's no good, is it? <laughs> said, God damn it, you're right, always you're right. <laughs> But he said, we make a good pair. I come up with these wild ideas, you adopt the good ones and throw out the bad ones. <laughs> he was satisfied, and uh, he'd had his say, 
he went away happy. In Luxembourg, the Germans used to shell us from long range. And uh, fortunately, they shot over my hotel. <laughs> they hit on the outskirts of town instead of hitting me. I made only one concession. I moved from the German side of the hotel to the other side. <laughs> Because if he'd hit my side of the hotel, I lived on the second floor, he might have caused trouble. We didn't pay too much attention to it, except Patton called me up one night. He said, can't you get uh, Vandenberg, he was the Air Force, to get up so we get some planes up and make those fellas shut up? Because when you got planes up to locate them, they'd shut up. And uh, he said, uh, they hit my headquarters, killed a man in my headquarters. They just hit me in the yard across the street from where I live. Said, I'm not afraid, but my dog Willie is scared. <laughs> General, uh, you characterized briefly General MacArthur, General Patton. How about General Montgomery? It's as difficult to deal with as uh, sometimes right. Fortunately, I didn't have to deal with Montgomery too much. He was under Ike. And uh, Ike threatened to relieve him. And when he wrote the letter out, asking Churchill to relieve him, uh, Montgomery's chief of staff, General DeGangon, saw it and he said, please don't send that till I have a chance to talk to Marty. He went back and told Marty what was happening. Monty came to heal very quickly, but he was a hard man to handle. He wanted to command all the ground forces, and uh, I finally told Ike I wouldn't serve under him. Ike said, I thought you'd do anything I asked you to do. I said, I will, except for that. I will not serve under him. <laughs> and I said, Patton will not either. I've talked to him. <laughs> I don't think so. We were going to be successful. We told everybody, but not to mention the fact there's any chance of failure. Rumor got around among the assault divisions that every one of them would be killed. <coughs> so I went down and talked to every man in the division. Going over on one of the boats, when the correspondent saw a sergeant reading a book, he said, Sergeant, how can you be so calm about it? He said, aren't you worried? He said, no, General Bradley told us it'd be all right, so why should I worry? <laughs> so the talks did have some effect, I guess. Yes. General, on a related question, how would you uh, assess Field Marshal Rommel <laughs> in terms of uh, being a tactician? wants you to assess General Field Marshal Rommel as a tactician. I think he was good. He commanded the sector that I landed in. He had done a lot to strengthen that uh, sector. And in, in addition to the normal defenses of that sector, the day I hit Omaha Beach, I found the 352nd German Infantry Division maneuvering on the beach. That's what made it so hard. We fought until noon before we were successful. The other beaches went off very nicely. But Omaha Beach is particularly tough. It was, uh, they had a tide there of uh, eight feet and it was a quarter of a mile from low water mark to high water mark. And then back of that high water mark was a big tall cliff we had to climb. I've been back there several times since, and I wondered at the fact that we could climb it, let alone when somebody was shooting at us. General, which German commander did you consider as 
consider the most prominent? I think Ronald is the most successful, the best general they had. He strengthened the beach a lot that I attacked. In the fields behind the beach, he had put mines on top of them. He directed poles and put mines on top of them to catch our, uh, our gliders. And a lot, of, a lot of our gliders were lost by hitting those poles. General, do you know why that General Alexander, who had been very successful in Northern Africa, and apparently had worked well with you and General Eisenhower, was not given a role in, in Overlord? No, I don't. He was a good commander. In North Africa, I was given command of a corps and put up against a fixed German position. The British had held that position for a long time, had assaulted a couple of places and lost a lot of men. And uh, they put me in there with four divisions. I broke through it in two places, captured 41,000 German prisoners. One of the most welcome sights I saw during the war was 41,000 German prisoners marching down the road to be put in prisoner of war cages. We sent them back to the States. They found out they were going back to the States and they told our men, we're going to the States, where are you going? <laughs> They had a pretty good answer. They said, Berlin. <laughs> we didn't go to Berlin. There's some question in your minds why we didn't. I, crossed, I got to the Elbe River and met the Russians there. I was about 90 miles from Berlin. I called me up one night and said, can you go to Berlin? I said, yes. He said, what do you think about it? I said, well, it cost us, we figure we have plans for it. We figure it'll cost us 100,000 men, and then we'll have to get out and turn it over to the Russians. Why should we do it? I still think I was right. You don't give away 100,000 casualties easily. At least I didn't. I saw the plans for the invasion of Japan and I talked them over with General Marshall, and we estimated we'd lose 100,000 men. We dropped two bombs and that ended the war. A lot of people criticized us for dropping the bombs. But any time you can save 100,000 casualties, you do it. Any other questions? Hey, one back in the back. And General, uh, which was the most effective tactic employed by your armies in Europe? most effective tactic employed by his, his, by his army during World War II in Europe. Who is that? Uh, he wants to know if you have an opinion as to what was the most effective tactic employed by your forces in Europe. I don't know. We won, didn't we? <laughs> Question back there? I think he was just standing to salute the answer, General. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a that's a tremendous question answer to end on. It certainly is the essence of leadership. Is Ron Wetzel here? Will you come up, Ron? There he is. General. Ron Wetzel represents 16 graduates of the United States Military Academy who are now active members and special agents of the FBI. Good. And I've asked him to be present here this morning on this platform to represent all of them and all of us. And he's one of the supervisors that we asked you here to speak about, speak to. Normally, we give our distinguished lecture in these lecture series a little remembrance of uh, the occasion as a way of saying thank you. This is different. And this is special. General Bradley, in the history of the 
Bureau, 13 of these presentations have been made, all to Presidents of the United States or Attorneys General. Duty, honor, and country epitomize the military academy. Fidelity, bravery, and integrity are the motto of the FBI. We think that you, in huge measure, embody all of those principles, and, and we would like you to be one of us. And therefore, it's my pleasure to present you with this award, our, 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 our <coughs> I don't know what you call it, what it is, but what it means is that we would like to make you an honorary special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Thank you very special much. Special Agent me. General Bradley. <laughs> pretty good pistol shot. <laughs> In fact, I qualified as an expert last time I shot. I don't know what we're going to do to follow this one. <laughs> thank you, General Bradley. You'll always remember today. And thank you very much.